Are you a sex worker looking to build a new website or a website redesign? Then you'll want to consider Fox Digital. They did a fantastic job designing my website, Stripped by Sia. If you want your website done, mention that you're a listener of the show at foxdigital.design for 20% off. Tell them I sent you. Welcome back to another episode of Stripped by Sia, your podcast for strippers, sex workers, and all the fancy naked people in between. I am your host, Steph Sia, aka Kimchi on stage. You can probably find me out at this point. You can find me in a month uh, at the end of April. I will be dancing uh, where it all began. Um, and also the when I had the idea to start the show, you'll find me at the Penthouse Nightclub in Vancouver. I'll be there for a couple weeks and then Shakers the week after that before things get really crazy and I get married, which is really exciting, which I haven't shared in the show, but yay. <laughs> so that's kind of something um, exciting to look forward. If you want to come and chat with me in person, you can find me there. Um, I'm also a digital content creator. I was also a sugar baby for many, many years, no longer, but I sometimes speak about that experience on some earlier, earlier episodes back in like season one. Um, Guilds to it there. But of course, the show is not about me. The show is about sex workers. It's about destigmatizing sex work just to provide a better understanding of the work that it is that we do. Just because a lot of the times, you know, with media and movies and and religious groups and stuff, they are always telling the story and the narrative of what sex workers are and what we do and our background and all that stuff. But I just really want to create the show to set the record straight in terms of providing a very transparent approach uh, to provide a better like understanding of the work that it is that we do. Uh, and it is important work that we do as well. So I bring on different guests uh, every single week, whether they are talent, whether they are, you know, working behind the scenes, they're part of a nonprofit organization. Um, I really try to cover every single corner and there are many, many many corners and facets in the industry so i try my best to cover them all um so again we um are better educated um on the sex industry so that's just a little bit about me that's a little bit about the show um i just want to quickly pop on here and say thank you to my wonderful patreon subscribers um a few of you are on the top tier um of the subscription and i just want to say thank you you do get a fan recognition shout out on every single episode of the show so quickly just going to go down the list and of course if this spiel is boring to you you can go ahead and fast forward to the five minute mark and we can get started with the interview with our exciting guest which i I'll be announcing very shortly, but just want to say a quick hello to uh, Trey Lanti. We have Marty Lang. We've got Snoo Snoo all the way from Germany listening in. Uh, we have Arup Sarkar, who's also here from where I am in Vancouver, Canada. We have Jay Sunstern, also here from Vancouver, Canada. Justin Erickson from Washington, and uh, who I'm missing here, Ted McGuire. So just wanted to say hello and thank you for your financial support. All of this goes to basically my website uh, hosting costs and basically now my expenses since I'm now going to Expiz Miami. So I will be there for the first time and your money is going to help fund that part of the trip because um, if you didn't know, there are also costs that come with a lot of these adult shows and stuff too. And I'm attending so I can further my knowledge um, on what's happening with the sex industry, what's happening for myself as a creator, and how I can learn and just be a sponge. So thank you so much. Um, you can go ahead and check it out. It's patreon.com slash stripped by Sia and their subscription tier starting just at the low price of $4 a month. Feel free to check it out. I'm not going to talk much more about that. Um, there's a couple other people I need to thank here as well. So I just want to say hello and introduce you to Skyhawk After Dark TV, which is an adult network of other related podcasts, video casts, um, shows similar like this um, with different hosts and even people that I've brought on the show um, in previous seasons. So you can go ahead and check that out. It is skyhawkafterdarktv.com. And last but not least, I did mention your Patreon funds are going towards my website. It is strippedbysia.com. And that was um, made by a friend of mine. Um, his name is Anthony. He um, helped build my website, which has been great because I tried to do it myself and failed miserably. Um, 
And I feel like a lot of us may be in the same boat. Maybe you're in the um, market to build a website for yourself. It's time for you to do that and take that next step. Or maybe you have an existing website that you want to just revamp and refurbish and just want to kind of baba voom it up a bit. Um, he is sex worker friendly. He is an ally in our industry. And for listeners of Stripped by Sia, you do get 20% off. So please feel free to reach out to him. Tell him I sent you. His name is Anthony and you can contact him at foxdigital.design. Under five minutes. Okay, here we go. So I'm really excited to bring on this week's guest. I have watched many interviews. I've listened to many episodes on uh, her YouTube. Um, I've read a lot of things online, and I'm just really excited to chat. Today, we're going to be talking um, briefly about legalization in the state of Nevada. We're going to be talking about um, sex worker rights in Nevada and what that might look like because it is legal in much of Nevada, not everywhere, which we'll be talking about today in depth. We're also going to be talking about some recent conversations about potentially bringing decriminalization or legalization efforts in the state of California and some other amazing advocacy work that this person does. I just feel like she does so much. She is a content creator, also known as the world's most famous legal sex worker. She was also voted companion of the year for a few years in a row. She's an intimacy coach, sexual educator. Uh, I said content creator, but I briefly mentioned YouTuber. She does all the things. I would like to give a warm welcome to my guest today, who goes by the name of Alice Little. Alice, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, everyone. I'm Alice Little. I'm a legal sex worker, sex educator, intimacy expert, and sex worker rights advocate. This is really exciting to chat with you. I'm really excited for you to join me. I, I feel like you have accomplished so much and you've really, really made your mark in the industry. And also because I'm unfamiliar or not as familiar with the legalization model, I thought, obviously, I need to bring on an expert. And you're definitely a person to chat about this because it's about 25 episodes since we've talked about legalization and it's still a new topic and maybe a, a new concept for many people in the audience. So I feel like who better to bring on than the Alice Little herself. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Yes, legalization in Nevada is super unique. We are the only one of the 50 states to still have legal sex work. It's really interesting that there were brothels all across the country, all the way into the 70s and 80s in some cases, but all were slowly but surely criminalized, pushed out of existence. And so Nevada's kind of the final frontier as far as what legal sex work looks like in America. Yeah, definitely. And I know we've, we haven't we have touched much on it uh, on this show, uh, particularly. We do focus a lot on decriminalization, but I think it is really fair to speak and have that representation for those who are legal workers in the state of Nevada. And this might also ring true for other parts of the world. So again, um, just really trying to be transparent here and also just to bring a bit of education for those who don't know um, much about it, like myself. So um, maybe before we kind of dive into the meat of the topic today, maybe we can do like a, a brief like history lesson and just explain what legalization means and how that uh, operates in the state of Nevada and where that is actually allowed to occur. Yes. So it's important to understand that legalization started in the 1970s and is legislated at a county by county level. There's 20 counties in Nevada, 13 of which allow for legal brothels. Not all have active brothels right now. There's about 20 brothels currently active and running spread out across Nevada typically speaking in rural, smaller corners of the state. You won't see legalization in Reno. You won't see legalization in Las Vegas. The closest you're going to get is where I work, which is at the Chicken Ranch Brothel, which is about an hour outside in Nye County. So a completely separate county than Las Vegas, which is Clark County. Not mm -hmm. a lot of people realize there's a difference and you're going about an hour's distance outside of the strip. 
the gotcha. legislation happened in the 1970s in reaction to the existence of brothels that had already popped up. It's not like someone waved a magic wand and boom, there were brothels. <laughs> they were already there. And then the legislation came into play in order to figure out the best way to go about operating these locations in a way that was safe, consensual, and realistically profitable for the people who owned these various locations. The legislation was written in the 1970s primarily by the counties themselves in conjunction and coordination with the brothel owners. So as you can imagine, a lot of the legislation is very, very outdated. Not much has changed since the 70s. And it's important to understand that existing legislation really centers and protects brothel rights more so than sex worker rights. However, gotcha. there's a lot of okay. points to legalization too. For example, in reaction to the HIV crisis occurring in the 80s, health standards were implemented very routinely within the industry. Condoms remain absolutely mandatory. There's signs required to be posted throughout the facility, condoms mandatory. So there's no unrealistic or unsafe expectations when someone is coming to the location. Legislation handles that aspect of it for us, which is quite nice. Yeah, There's that's lots of really interesting bits of legislation. For example, it is currently not possible to open a new brothel. They're all grandfathered in through this existing legislation. So you can't just start a new location. There's the predetermined existing locations in the grandfathered in X designated residence areas, which essentially says, yes, adult things can happen in this zoning. Oh. No new area is zoned X. No new licenses are being issued. So therefore, in order to become a brothel owner or start a new brothel, you would have to buy an existing brothel. Okay. I did not know that. Okay. I'm learning already. Yeah. A couple minutes, but yes. Sorry. Continue. <laughs> yeah. There's two sets of legislation. There's the legislation that applies to the brothel and the requirements that the brothel itself needs to meet health standards, having a bar license, paying for the electric. They make sure that we have a security gate around the property so guests are buzzed in and out so we can check IDs and make sure that everyone's of legal age and is supposed to be there. No one's sneaking onto the property, you know. Um, <laughs> and then there's the set of legislation for the sex workers themselves, which is completely separate. We're considered independent contractors of this right. particular business. So they follow their licensure and set of legislation. And then we have our own individual licensure and legislation. Okay. So we obtain a work permit directly through the county. We go into the sheriff's office. We do a full FBI background check, complete with fingerprinting four mm. times a year in Nye County. Oh. It costs $150 per quarter for that work license, which then allows us to be registered in the county to work at that specific location. Right. If we were to change locations, we would then also have to reapply for a license, go back through the process, resubmit our fingerprints, Pay the hundred fifty again. Gotcha. Not super ideal, right? But that's <laughs> currently the that's currently the written law as it stands right now in Nevada. Mm -hmm. The legislation is designed to prevent minors from being able to enter the industry, prevent folks with like a violent criminal history from being able to enter the industry for safety of everyone. Each county, of course, has its own disqualifiers for being able to obtain a work permit. So where you work is going to also impact what your licensure requirements are. Some gotcha. counties are more felony friendly than others. Some counties have it. No, if you've ever had a felony, you can never work here. Other mm -hmm. counties, if it's five years or older, you can work here. And if you've ever been involved with quote unquote illegal prostitution and received a charge for that, that also can impact your ability to receive a license depending on the specific county, which is 
really important to note because that's also a little bit of a problem. And again, we're looking at 1970s legislation here. Right, right. Gosh. Okay. I mean, and this is really great. I mean, and we can go further and further and further into legislation and policy and stuff too. But I think this serves at a, as a really, really good um, foundation for um, how things operate in the state of Nevada. Um, I know, I know that my audience is also really curious about your story in terms of how you yourself got involved in the sex work and in, in um, legal sex work in Nevada. Um, or if you have more of a background from elsewhere, you could also start from there. Up to you. Yeah. So I actually learned about the Nevada brothels from a fellow sex educator. Prior to ever working at the Nevada brothels, I was actually working the front desk of a BDSM dungeon in New York City. It's kind of like a receptionist dash. I was like schedule coordinating. So I was responsible for finding the different educators and bringing them in and having them present. And of course, I sat down and learned everything I damn well could and eventually <laughs> gained enough knowledge that I was being asked to now travel and present from I started when I was 18 and was traveling around by the time I was 25, which is when I entered the Nevada brothels for the first time. So I came into this with a lot of education and knowledge before ever stepping for it into full service sex work for the first time personally. Gotcha. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Um, talk, tell us a little bit about like your background in sex education too, because I also think that's really important as well. Yes. So I found very, very quickly in high school that nobody knew what in the world they were doing and sex was terrible and everyone was terrible at it and nobody <laughs> knew how to communicate and I was kind of over it. So I was like, this is, <laughs> no, this is silly. No. And so like, I took to the internet like any young millennial did and started educating myself while I was in high school and kind of getting interested in some of this stuff and like, oh, the naughty boys, that's how you tie somebody up safely. Got it. Got it. <laughs> that, that's way better than what I was trying to do on my own. Oh, God, yes. Like, <laughs> I had this opportunity to gain some knowledge through the internet and started to share it with my peers and by the time that I was in college and started working at this dungeon, they didn't have an educational track initially. And I'm like, that's, that's dumb. We have this beautiful <laughs> facility. Why in the world do we not bring in some educators? People are constantly asking, how do I learn about this, that, or the other thing? And so I started to find the different people that were already out there doing the work. And many of them were already in New York themselves, intimacy professionals, and bringing them in to start this educational project. And it was really cool. And I learned so much from that. And then kind of took it upon myself to take everything I learned, go and educate myself further, and then take that knowledge and continue passing it on. And so mm -hmm. it's something that I think really important because there's always, always, always new information, new studies, new technology and developments. Like a, a real easy one, people don't realize this. PrEP is now available as an injectable. Like for people oh. who don't want to take a daily pill, you can do PrEP as a twice a month injectable now. That's tremendous. Like, yeah. yeah. And no one's talking about it. And it's so, so important. So like, that's something that's very, very near and dear to my heart. Amazing. And Leah, I mean, going back to what you were saying too, because I just feel like, you know, back when we we're in high school and like, you know, learning about our bodies and, you know, some of us experimenting with sex ourselves and, you know, with our first partners and whatnot, like – there's a lot of questions that no one wants to ask <laughs> sometimes or like you might be too embarrassed to ask. So it's really important that you're doing this type of work because we need more educators um, because there's just, well, one, teachers are, are at full capacity. Uh, they don't are not always comfortable teaching that kind of content to their students as well. So where do people go? They go on the internet. They go ask their friends. Um, some not great resources and a lot of misinformation that's out there. So um, kudos to you and I salute you for 
for spreading the word and and to, like educating the masses basically. Um, so you. basically, you took this information. You were working as a sex educator, and then you ended up flying uh, across the country, moving and entering the full service sex industry. Um, tell us a little bit about your decision in wanting to do that and how you were maybe and this is maybe an assumption, but perhaps better equipped with all the information education that you did have that you had learned and um, gotten from your time in New York City as sex educator and how that maybe better prepared you for entering. Oh, yeah. Not to mention, like, not to mention there's a ton of financial privilege of being able to just start in a very expensive legal industry. So I have to cover all of my expenses in order to start as a legal sex worker and make the career jump from sex educator and cell phone saleswoman to now (laughs) doing full service full time. So the first thing I did was applied online, which it's important to note with limited locations, this puts the power in the hands of the brothel owners because we brothel workers need to apply at these locations and these locations then respond back to the folks of their choosing. So there's a certain amount of privilege in the first place of, am I able to get in? Will any mm-hmm. of these locations accept my application? Right. By and large, most locations are pretty diverse. And at the same time, we still have a lot of progress to do. So I like to point <laughs> that out. Yes. <laughs> so I was fortunate enough to be accepted to work at a location. I had enough time to do a little bit of background research and chat with my friend who had previously worked at a brothel before. I learned a little bit about the materials I would need to bring with me, such as condoms, lube, safe oral sex supplies, dental dams. The laurel oral sex panties weren't around back in 2015, and so (laughs) I needed to get as many dental dams as I possibly could. Um, Lingerie sets in a variety of options. Sex toys for all different shapes and sizes of bodies. I needed to figure out what services I was comfortable offering as well, because not everyone offers everything Right. Like, I know a lot about BDSM. Mm -hmm. I don't mind pulling out floggers and toys and having fun with that. But someone without that education, of course, isn't going to offer that service. They just wouldn't know how. And so I had to figure out what in the world I was all going to pack with me in order to get out there. So I had a tremendous amount of upfront expenses just to be able to make that career jump. Plus, I had to be able to afford my flight afford the weekly required by law STD and STI testing, which we pay for out of pocket. We can't use our health insurance for this. We specifically need to pay between 80 and $125, depending on where you work and which series of tests it is. We do a blood test monthly with a swab weekly. So we pay for that expense. Um, And then, of course, the licensure costs, which vary depending on county. Some counties additionally require the individual worker to obtain a business license. So then you also have a Nevada business license expense. And so all in all, I want to say it's between $800 and $1,500 before you even step foot into the ranch just to get the opportunity to give it a go. Oh, and photos. You also need pictures. I mean, I was fortunate enough. I had a decent camera and I just took my own photos. But if you were to go and get a photo shoot, that's another five to that 500 to thousand dollar expense or so. Easy. Easy. So I mean, low end, low end, let's say it's, you know, $800 is the barrier of entry. Mm -hmm. if not significantly more than that. And so it was definitely a challenge at first. I needed to like Mm -hmm. make sure I had enough money and savings. Definitely a point of privilege there. I had a fallback plan at the time. I had like some credit cards and stuff. So like Mm -hmm. if I flew out to the ranch and I made no money, I wouldn't be impoverished. I'd still be able to survive. So that's definitely a privilege point. Mm -hmm. And then I also kind of knew what to expect going into it from having that point of contact with someone who was already in the industry, which really, really helped me get started initially. Wow. Okay. That was, and thank you for that really 
detailed and in depth approach too, because I I feel that I really um, would answer like a lot of folks' questions in terms of like how do you guys start it and whatnot. Um, a question for you is um, how did you decide that you wanted to move specifically to the state of Nevada? Was it because of sex work being legalized there, there's maybe more protection in some capacity, or were you considering other places or to start full service, or was it specifically I'm going to Nevada and I'm going to be working in a brothel? Tell us about that. I I specifically sought out Nevada brothels one because it's legal. I didn't have to worry about any sort of fear from the law, and most importantly to me. Because it's legal, that means I can then use that money to invest, to get a mortgage, and kind of invest in my financial future. Mm -hmm. Whereas speaking with folks and knowing many folks that worked independently, access to safe banking was one of the most tremendous hurdles for them in their careers. And that was something that I, again, I had the privilege to start my career legally and not face that same level of stigma from banking. Right. Not that I'm fully insulated from banking stigma. It's important to note that our legal income is only legal in Nevada. So like we have a credit mm-hmm. union that we can use that works with us, but we can absolutely still be turned away by major banks for financials. Like Wells right. Fargo yeah. closed a whole bunch of sex workers accounts, wow. like only fans creators accounts, yeah. like, not protected craziness. There. So I mean, there are some protections, star, 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 lots of caveats. <laughs> and at the same time, it certainly is still in terms of just sheer legal privilege, way more advantageous to be able to even just have access to a Nevada credit union than trying to figure out how to get a bank account at all. Yeah. And this is like actually a really, really great segue to to talk about because in the beginning of the show, too, you spoke um, about the separation between, you know, brothel rights and sex workers rights and how those are two separate specific things. So maybe we can talk about that and then we could start to go down this conversation about sex worker rights and then we'll kind of talk about your um, Nevada Brothel Association that you co-founded as well. But let's start from there and then work our way down. <laughs> yes. So Nevada law is written to very much so protect the business entity, in this case, the Nevada Brothel and the requisite property and license itself. So they mm-hmm. have the protections of all the small businesses. They have the ability to obtain and leverage small business loans, various things like any other small business in Nevada would. Keep right. in mind, of course, that the Nevada brothel license itself costs, depending on the county, up to $150,000 per year. So, I mean, it protects their rights at a very, very high cost. I'm paying one fifty. dollars they're paying 150000 Right. At the same time, this allows them to be the only show in town. They're the only legal location in which sex work is able to take place. Independent right. contractors like myself have a contract with the ranch, which then allows the ranch to split our income 50-50. So when we book an experience through the ranch, of that experience automatically goes to the location. 50% of that then goes to me. We each pay our requisite taxes out of that amount and our requisite expenses, licensure, et cetera, out of that amount. So it's like a 50-50 split at the majority of locations. Right. Now, as far as codifying sex worker rights, the brothels themselves definitely ensure that we have the right to say no at any point in time to anybody for any reason at all. We can stop a party in the middle of a party. We don't have to accept anything that we don't want to accept, see anyone we don't want to see, offer Mm -hmm. services that we don't want to offer. We don't have to go to any lineup, which is where anyone who's currently available would come to the parlor to greet a walk-in guest who doesn't have an appointment and isn't sure who he wants to see and wants to see who's available. Well, Everyone who wants to then would participate in that lineup and potentially have the opportunity to make an arrangement with that guest. But even even that is a choice. Right. Again, 
every brothel is different and each brothel's contract is different. So I strongly right. recommend ladies that are interested in joining this industry to locate and chat with somebody who's worked at that specific location because every single brothel that I have worked at has been a different experience in terms of work expectations, contract expectations, as well as sex workers' rights. Some mm -hmm. brothels are very well-minded to sex worker rights. For example, where I work, they'll even go so far as to like figure out how to adapt the kitchen to be gluten-free for me, which is really sweet. Like, awesome. I don't mind. I can eat prepackaged food. You guys, it's okay. Like, I know I'm the pain <laughs> in the butt with food allergies. Like, you don't have to go through the whole song and dance for me. But like, they very much are like, no, this is a point that like, if you're paying for room and board, that it comes with this. This is part of the services that we are agreeing to provide for you. So yeah, right. we're going to adapt to make sure we can do that. Mm -hmm. Which is really nice. Very yeah. ideal in that regard. <laughs> Such a good um, touch. <laughs> yeah. And so I founded and was a co-founder in the Nevada Brothel Association in reaction to an outside public perception that was terribly inaccurate as to what the brothels are, who works there, what happens there. Um, right. There was a very small religious minority in Lyon County that had partnered with NCOSC, which is an anti-sex trafficking organization who truly is just an anti-sex organization. Yeah. By, by, you know, totally. one of those. And so they said all sex work is trafficking. No one could do this willingly and consensually. There's minors at the brothels. Look at uh, that four foot eight Alice Little. She's so tiny. And I'm like, excuse me, I'm 27. I'm not even the youngest person that works here. Are you for real right now? <laughs> like, I was over it. And so myself and a few colleagues teamed together to create an organization to make sure that our rights, not the brothel owners, us, we, the workers, were the ones who were actually speaking about what's happening inside of these brothels. Because mm -hmm. I know what's happening inside the brothel. Yeah, I work there. I work there constantly. <laughs> like, there's nobody who knows the environment better than somebody who's actually living and working in the environment. And so I took it upon myself to organize a series of town halls and educate the general public as to what the brothels are, what the policies and procedures are. How do we prevent trafficking? How do we benefit the local community? In what ways do we prevent minors from entering the industry? How do we keep harm from coming to the workers? And it was all educational, like every room's got a panic button that goes immediately to the front in the sheriff's office. We've got a variety of like safety protocols that we have enacted. There's all sorts of different just little details that people just had no idea about because they never had the opportunity to learn. Yeah. So like I kind of almost felt like it was a calling back to my days as a sex educator, except now I'm being a brothel educator and just letting people know that, Hey, I'm just your average neighborhood sex worker. It's cool. <laughs> we all exist here. And frankly speaking, that. the money from the brothels, our licensures, our fees, our tax dollars, was so much money in that particular county that it paid for all the police vehicles and ambulances for the county. Like, wow. what were the cops going to do? Ride horses? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the the county in many ways very financially benefits from having these locations. Mm -hmm. And so upon learning more about it, we ended up winning that vote by an 85% margin, which was enough to Amazing. stop an attempt to criminalize at the state level. Because, of course, he wasn't just going to go away. He wanted to keep it going. Yes. Yes. Wow. I mean, that's incredible. And I, I commend you for doing that because uh, not not all of us, unfortunately, are able to, you know, come out and, and speak and advocate for our rights. So it's one, it's really brave of you to do that. Um, and you've already acknowledged that you come from a place of privilege, but it really clearly shows just how passionate you are um, about this in terms of like advocating for what is um, what we're entitled to and also uh, educating the public and also the community that you're in um, as well because yeah, there's like, so much misinformation. Yeah, and like at 
advocacy work to anyone who's thinking of getting involved in it, by the way. Pro tip, it does come with some very real risks and not from the people that you would expect. The, it's It was the church that ended up stalking and harassing me. They tried to follow yeah. me home from work multiple, multiple times. Like, oh they had the church bumper sticker on the car, and they followed me through multiple, multiple right-hand turns. I did a full figure eight to make sure that I was actually being followed before driving oh. to the police station to get them off my tail. Like, that's crazy. There's some real crazy people out there, and that's not to deter anyone from doing advocacy work, but it's to empower anybody else going into it, know what you're getting into, go with a buddy, have a buddy system, ideally have somebody like drop you off and pick you up from events. Don't go straight wow. home. Like send me an email. I will make sure that you've got the knowledge you need because we do, we do need more activists. We absolutely totally. do. And I also understand why so many people are like, maybe I don't want to get personally involved because yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. there's some really crazy risks out there. Oh boy. Oh my gosh, you know what? We don't even really talk about that too because I've, I've brought so many people that, you know, are involved in some capacity with advocacy work for sex worker rights. But I've never, or maybe people have never shared this before. And thank you so much for sharing because that's really freaking scary. Um, but to talk about some of these risks about <laughs> getting involved with um, can, any kind of like advocacy groups or any kind of like political activism as well. But like um, for sex worker specifically and advocating for them is it mainly and this is from your just your own ex personal experience but is it mainly the opposition that you're seeing is is from the church and like right-wing opposing parties <laughs> yes you're nodding yes uh, by and large yes it's a lot of religious morality conservatism we're seeing mm -hmm. a lot of um ties between the nonprofit. The nonprofit anti sex work, anti sex trafficking organizations, right. and the anti porn groups and the various morality nonprofits that were in existence in the 70s and 80s that were mm -hmm. largely responsible for the criminalization and closure of brothels throughout America. So, right. like, it, it's the same group. They've just put on a different mask and have a new 501c3 in name, but like, it's the same exact tired, fallible argument. We uh. know that minors aren't working at the brothels. Why? Because we have to submit our literal fingerprints to the sheriff in his office and we go through an FBI database. Do you think you're smart enough to beat the FBI database? Yeah. I don't think I don't I'm think smart so. enough to beat the FBI <laughs> database. Like... <laughs> Huh, that's like just, I, I don't that's know how somebody fakes that. Like, how do you, how, how do you? I, I don't see how it's literally possible, possible for somebody to do what they're trying to claim is being done. Right, and like it, it's not even just that. Like they do random checks because again, there was so much noise about oh, what if there's a minor? Okay, we'll go to the brothel and we'll check everybody's ID at random when they don't even expect it. How about that for a solution? Oh, okay. <laughs> So they did that and there were no problems. Shocker. Like, right? Oh my God. I was, teasing that, I was teasing that, you know, they missed somebody. They actually did. <laughs> they missed the house cat. They didn't, they didn't give a work card for the house cat. Cashmere. <laughs> Unlicensed pussy in the house. Unacceptable. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny I because you, you mentioned that like a lot of these organizations are always just like, parading that it's about the children we gotta uh, like protect the children even where i am in canada it's always like um we have an act that's um kind of in, in alignment with like bossa sesta and um one of the things there is about protecting exploited persons uh, most of all protecting children but it's never really about the children is it like it's usually <laughs> just about no Typically, and in this no. particular place, um, people engaging in sex work, which is really frustrating. Yeah, because if it was about the children, 16-year-old Sintonia Brown wouldn't have been charged with prostitution if it was about the children. She was a minor victim, and yet in the eyes of the law, they tried her as an adult 
for protecting herself from sexual violence. So you can't tell me it's about the children when we have this incredibly national case. It was large enough, I think, Kim Kardashian got involved and helped hire her a lawyer at one point. Like, that was some next level stuff right there. But like, yeah. that was a minor. You want to protect the children? That's who you should have been protecting. And you right. failed. So maybe, just maybe, possibly, we need to find solutions by actually working with the industry itself. Because the yeah. reality is, the reality is, even if somebody is in a situation where they don't want to do something, you know who the very first person who's going to tell that girl, no, you shouldn't do that. You know what? Let's go ahead and let's like take care of this so this isn't happening. Sex workers. Mm -hmm. We are the very first person. The very first folks that if we get sense that something's not right, we're going to say something because we care a lot about our own. That's why there's mm -hmm. so much peer level activism. Um, shout out, by the way, Sex Worker Mutual Aid Fund Las Vegas, Summer Hearts yeah. does amazing, amazing work. Speaking of like sex worker mutual aid, it's by sex workers, for sex workers, micro grants to help cover gaps in funding that sex workers may have. And that's why you see those things happening. Like no sex worker is getting famous because they're protecting sex worker rights or doing nonprofit work. We right. do it because we actually care a yeah. lot about yeah. what happens to other people in this industry. And so like rather than fight with us, if people really want to prevent sex trafficking, you got, you got to work with us. That's the reality. Yes. That's definitely a reality too. And I know that you had a recent conversation with Supervisor Hillary Ronan recently in the state of California to talk about potential solutions about, you know, decriminalization or maybe legalization of whatever might, what might work in that state. Can you tell us a bit about the conversation that you had with her and, and seeing what kind of outcome that might be able to come out of this? Yeah, it was such a good conversation. So a little bit of background history. Hillary Ronan is the supervisor of San Francisco. And in San Francisco, there is this area called Cap Street, which is being impacted by a lot of street-based sex work right now. In okay. traditional terms, we would call that a, a street-based track where a lot right. of sex workers are all congregating in this specific area. And unfortunately, in this area, that also looks like a lot of congregation of um, sex workers with a lot of marginalizations, sex workers who may have pimps, sex workers who are experiencing violence in broad daylight in the street in San Francisco. This is mm -hmm. the reports that Supervisor Ronan is getting. So the first mm -hmm. thing she did is she put up concrete barriers. Because that's going to stop it, right? Right. <laughs> the concrete barriers were very quickly moved out of the way and nothing changed. Right. So then, bigger concrete barriers were put on Cap Street. And oh, you know no. what happened when we did that? We prevented a fire truck from being able to reach a fire and made an extremely dangerous situation for the people Gosh. that live in San Francisco. Totally. And so... Yeah. Clearly, this is not the solution either. What no. do we do? What if we try and legalize it? And so she then put forward a legalization proposal. And oh. I've been following the goings on of decriminalization, legalization, and various things that are impacting folks around the country. And so when I saw that happen in this like rapid occurrence of both bad, very bad, and, huh, well, that came out of left field. Yeah, I decided to reach out because I actually am very familiar with legalization and the policies, procedures, as well as the good, the bad, and the ugly from it and the various things that we can learn. So when mm -hmm. I saw her proposal, I thought to myself, well, I want to be able to take this knowledge that I have and make sure that San Francisco doesn't end up an exact copycat clone of the 1970s law that Nevada brothels have because right. I know that that's imperfect. Yeah. So myself yeah. and... I guess four or five other sex workers all have reached out to her and we each got to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And so when awesome. we had the opportunity to chat, we really dove into like the meat and potatoes of how does legalization benefit sex workers? It mm -hmm. increases the price of 
sex work. It puts us in a financially advantageous position. It gives us protections. It creates a system and location for this to happen so it's not happening in the middle of the streets, et cetera, et cetera. We talked about the bad, the licensure fees, the prevention of sex workers from being able to be brothel owners and how an ideal model would be more of a co-op situation like ones that exist in Thailand. And I think there's another co-op brothel in New Zealand or Australia. Um, okay. They never got back to me by email to confirm <laughs> if they were co-op. Their website looks like a co-op. They said it's worker owned. Gotcha. So I think that's a more idealized model. And then we mm-hmm. talked about the downright ugly side of the Nevada brothel. For example, there was a set of legislation at one point in time that created a scenario by which sex workers were unable to leave without their doctor's certificate or clearance expiring. So if we left, we then would have to pay that fee and go through the doctor process again. Again, And so it created a scenario by which really the sex workers had to stay at the brothel. Right. What? Yeah. That's not great. That's not right. Thankfully, that, that was overturned. Ironically, just before the pandemic and the whole world went into lockdown. Right. Yay, we beat lockdown just in time for everyone to be in lockdown at home. But (laughs) that legislation has been changed. And we discussed some of those different nuances. And it really ended up being an invaluable conversation just in terms of sharing data, finding out what knowledge is going to enable the supervisor to put forward things that are most likely to gain momentum because mm-hmm. the reality is whether we like it or not politics is goddamn slow yeah it is <laughs> law is slow politics are slow and right. people are only in office for as long as they're in office right yeah. so how long do we have someone in office for we've got two years all right we've got two years to get this ball rolling and so we talked about various ideas and strategies for how do we address the community's concerns because they want to make sure there's not minors involved. They want to make sure there's not violence in the streets. We talked a little bit about the financial aspects of this. Like why would communities want to allow a brothel to pop up in their Mm -hmm. County? Like where's the financial benefits from them? Right. And we also talked a whole lot about immediate short-term solutions to minimize the amount of violence that's currently happening for sex workers and discussed ideally codifying something like a sex worker bill of rights that includes some amnesty. We might not be able to do decriminalization tomorrow, today, next year, but if someone's experiencing sexual violence and reports a sexually violent crime, can we give them amnesty from being charged with another crime like prostitution. If we can do that, that alone creates a scenario by which sex workers can now go to the police, report if their rights are being violated, and they know they're not going to get hit with something else legally. So it's like an imperfect first step forward. But in my opinion, that's going to be the most effective way to quickly get some form of sex worker rights codified, which then creates legal precedence, which is everything. Everything here in America is based off of legal precedence. What's right. been done and written before. If we can right. create precedence for sex worker rights here in San Francisco, well, we can create precedence for sex workers' rights all throughout California, yeah. maybe into exactly. Oregon, maybe at a national level. It's it's something. Right. And that's my yeah. hope is to get something started in the right direction and not just yeah. let this stall out. Totally. And it sounds like a really valuable conversation that was had. And like, uh, kudos to you. And also, as well as the other sex workers that were involved uh, within that conversation, because it's so, so, so important that they start to utilize and incorporate and consult with actual sex workers (laughs) to get some policies created. And that's usually a component that is missing with a lot of like um, political parties and things that they want to change, but they never talk to any of us. So, so thank you for Mm -hmm. at least igniting a bit of that conversation and, and hopefully, you know, making those steps in the right direction (laughs) for progress. Um, 
there is another piece that I want to speak to you about because I know that we I could probably just talk to you for hours at this point. You're so fascinating. <laughs> I'm just so oh, interested. I love, you. I love hearing you talk. Um, I know that you also founded um, Hookers for Healthcare um, as well. And that is, and correct me if I'm wrong, that's you're fighting for healthcare policies that benefit sex workers and other stigmatized groups. Can you speak yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah. So this was in reaction to the Obama care program that started, which unfortunately really put many independent contractors like myself in challenging situations where there were no providers. There was no one offering services to anybody within our specific demographic of independent contractors, which is ridiculous. Right. So I first started this by campaigning to get us access to insurance plans to be able to get providers into that network, which is something that we achieved within the first six months. Oh, From awesome. there, we pivoted to then making sure that all of my colleagues understood how to obtain health insurance, because at this point, the Obama Health Share Network website, it was new, it was confusing. And it took you about six months to get an appointment with somebody to walk you through it because there weren't enough volunteers to help people navigate the system. And so I said, well, that's dumb. I'll help you navigate the system. And so I kind of put together a few peers and trained other people on here's how you navigate and here's the differences between PPO and HMO. And you want to make sure that the coverage is in the person's home state and where their primary care physician is. And you need to make sure that you've got reciprocal coverage and out of network and make sure there's benefits. So I kind of trained everybody on those systems, came up with a kind of protocol for getting folks insured because healthcare mm -hmm. is unfortunately expensive and very difficult to obtain in this country. So I tried to yeah. make that a little bit easier. And then now I continue the educational front as far as hookers for healthcare in the form of both continued advocacy. I always make sure that there's various providers available to independent contractors, continuous enrollment at the top of each year, helping anyone change their plans if they need to, if they've undergone like a new life circumstance, had a baby, gotten married, mm -hmm. gotten divorced. Maybe they've had a super successful business and now they have employees that they need to offer insurance through. How do you do that as a sex worker? Well, yeah. I can kind of walk through it to the best of my ability anyway. And if something <laughs> surpasses my knowledge, I've got other resources now available to start pulling from and it's really just been this beautiful awesome. thing like I've gone so far as to start building up like preferred provider lists so like I've got a list of like primary care physicians that are sex worker friendly there's uh, awesome. various organizations that are coordinating sex worker friendly therapists shout out to mm -hmm. pineapple support they're doing sure, a pretty yes. good job on the mental health front um yes Gosh, and, and knowledge, knowledge too. I'm doing continuous education. I'm going to be speaking at an event coming up, I want to say in August, for Ooh. ASN Magazine, and educating oh. about uh, safer sex practices. Not many people realize that uh, the CDC updated their safe sex protocols and what you test and how you test and why you test for those things. And right. so I've partnered with a physician to kind of go together and share this desperately needed knowledge with as many people as possible. That's amazing. Oh my gosh. Huge congratulations. And I mean, that's a huge accomplishment as well. I, I just love the whole notion of you helping other people and helping their access and just making things a lot easier because like the U.S. healthcare system is, I would say, deeply flawed, um, very expensive and inaccessible for so many people. Um, so that is, this is huge. And um, I'm so excited. I was so excited to talk to you about that too because it's just like, uh, I mean – Amongst everything that you do, I think this is really great and, and it shows that you really do have a, a deep passion for helping others and it really does show with all the efforts that you have taken in your career and continue to take in your career as well. Um, I also want to ask you, like, where do you think your advocacy is going to go and like, what are next steps for you or do you have plans for the future? I know you have a speaking engagement in August, but like, what is the, the end goal for this? So like my long-term hope is to see sex worker rights codified 
at ideally a national level, but realistically mm -hmm. this happens at community-based levels in order to get the ball rolling, make things happen a little bit more dynamically and a little bit faster. So my mm -hmm. plan moving forward is to stay involved with folks like Supervisor Ronan, assist as much as I absolutely can. And then I'm also continuing the conversation in other areas of opportunity with existing nonprofits that are wanting to say, extend their offerings to sex workers. I've got a conversation, gosh, later this month with Hey Denver to talk a bit about how they can further benefit their local sex workers and offer support, see what kind of opportunities exist within that space. I've got a, a few contacts in Washington, D.C. that are professional lobbyists. And so every so often they'll like send me the name of like a random senator or representative and be like, <laughs> hey, send them the email. And the yeah. email being that, hi, I'm Alice Little and I'm making myself available for you. Ask me anything because it all starts with just answering questions before we can start asking legislators to do anything for us. We've got to educate them on who in the world we are. And that's something that, frankly speaking, I love being able to do as a service to the community as a whole. I am in a financial position where I can give my time for free to these various representatives, supervisors, Congress folks to really make sure that they have the thorough understanding and knowledge. What is the difference between decriminalization and legalization? Why is it beneficial to have decriminalization followed by a system of regulation? How does it help the local communities? Things of that sort. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I mean, kudos to you. You do so much. I'm incredibly impressed by you. And one, the way you speak is just amazing. And I could just like listen to you talk for so long. Um, and we probably can talk for another couple hours for sure. <laughs> But I know that the audience definitely had some questions for you as well. So I feel like it might be best to move on to that portion of the show. Um, I know that some of these questions came in from Twitter and we'll just kind of navigate them as they come in. So uh, the first question is, uh, what model of sex work policy do you feel is the most effective and safe for workers? In my opinion, Right now, the best system anywhere in the world is what currently exists in New Zealand, which is sometimes called the New Zealand or NZ model. This mm -hmm. is full decriminalization of both sex work purchase as well as selling, so full decrim across the board, and they have some limited oversight, various committees into how do you do this safely that speak as to safety patterns. They've got limited licensure that only impacts brothels being operated by third parties over a certain size. And they've really used their legal code to mm -hmm. not necessarily legalize, but kind of um, structure around and framework it, I think is the right word. Mm -hmm. Like they provide the framework for this to exist without the criminalized component, nor the full legalization that you may see reflected perhaps in Nevada, which is very codified, typified legal language. Right, right. And such a great answer, too. If any folks are interested in hearing about the New Zealand model for full decriminalization, please listen to the episode that I did with Vixen Temple, who is a New Zealand-based sex worker down there. Also a huge, huge, huge advocate for decrim and sex worker rights as well. Um, feel free to listen to that. There's lots of great goodies and information and tidbits there that you can learn. <laughs> um, next question is from the same person. What are the shortcomings of the brothel model? Oh, gosh, plenty. I mean, the financial discrimination, there's the discrimination around background checks, there's the discrimination as far as who is able to be hired at the level of just getting past the brothel owner or whomever is processing the work applications. There's multiple, multiple shortcomings, but the biggest shortcoming of all is the fact that it was written in the 1970s and hasn't been updated since. Yeah. There was supposed to be an update. There was a work study. There was a committee. It was fully funded. And then 
the pandemic happened. Oh, no. Oh. Yeah. And unfortunately, that study really was just kind of put on the back burner, deprioritized, defunded, because, of course, the government had bigger concerns at that point of time. And so I'm hoping that we can get Nevada law updated and modernized. We've had some small wins along the way. We've changed the work card from saying prostitute to courtesan. We've Mm -hmm. managed to do away with the the lockdown policy, that doctoral requirement that essentially kept everybody there. So there's been tremendous gains within that system, but there's still a lot of progress. Right. Lots of progress to be had. And thanks for being so transparent about this as well. Again, another reason why I brought you on, <laughs> sharing all oh, facts. I mean, like, <laughs> I, it's so interesting because, like, I have found tremendous success within this industry. And at the same time, you have to be realistic about any, any system of industry. There's always going to be room for improvement. There's always going to be sure. flaws within the system. And change happens from within the system itself if it truly benefits those that are being impacted. So like, I almost feel like I have a responsibility to be super transparent and be like, Mm -hmm. yes, I made a bunch of money and here's all the downsides too. Cause there's such, such a broad picture to the tapestry and environment around the brothels. And it's so, so nuanced and interesting. Absolutely. And I feel like sometimes if people might like try to tune into this episode, they're like, oh, like I'm, we were, we're all for decrim, but like, um, like legalization isn't the right model, but like having the opportunity to, to listen to you, listen to your own beliefs, but also like listen to the reasons why you chose, uh, specifically Nevada where you want to work and stuff too, to describe the ins and outs and also identify the areas where, to which it can be improved. Is, is so important and such an important piece of the conversation. So thank you. Um, oh, you're so welcome. Like, I, I have so <laughs> much respect for the New Zealand system. And at the same time, our legal language and legal use of language is not the same here in America as New Zealand. And right. there's got to be a translation portion of where we take their legal language and have to adapt it for an American legal framework. Right. And... I feel like a lot of people are afraid of the word legalization, but if we're adapting the New Zealand system and that's what we're passing into legalization, most sex workers are pointing that as being their ideal preference of sex work modality. Mm -hmm. If we can codify that, even if we use the word legalization, if we can codify that in a way that centers sex workers and we're involved in the process, I don't think we have anything to fear from this concept of legalization because it then affords us those financial rights and privileges in New Zealand, for example, there's nothing that guarantees them the right to operate in a specific location. So there's discrimination that they face Mm -hmm. as far as some areas don't allow home-based sex work or won't allow for brothels. And it's like now discrimination being done by the County. So like even New Zealand isn't Mm -hmm. perfect and certain aspects of legalization can help, put those protections into place that's that's all legalization is the codification of all the benefits and guarantees and promises that we're looking for to be able to do our work safely sanely and beneficially exactly and and so so well said <laughs> by the way um Alice, there were just a couple more questions here as well um this person's writing in also from twitter and of course, go back to our conversation with uh, your chat with Supervisor Hilary Ronan in California in uh, San Francisco. How many black, brown, trans, and queer sex workers were involved in that conversation? Well, it was a one on one conversation. I know that four or five other sex workers also had one on one conversations. And I know that multiple marginalizations were represented by various other sex workers in different forms and fashions. Not all of those sex workers are active sex workers. One of the sex workers with marginalizations is now a retired sex worker who isn't very like face in. They don't really yeah. show their face and name in the industry since they've now retired from the industry and have an outside, actually legal focused career, which is really interesting. And so they've mm. been having a lot of conversations from my understanding about a lot of the things around that nature. 
Right. Yeah. And it's important that you note that too, because not everyone is afforded the privilege to be um, face out. And and I know that we were briefly touching on this topic earlier, uh, pre-recording too. Um, and I have also talked about that too in a previous episode, like do we, do we face in or face out? What does privilege look like to people? So, and there are definitely many various reasons and all valid reasons why people choose to be face in, why they choose to be face out. And that is their business and their business only. So I think mm-hmm. it's important for us to say that. And like, you might not be at liberty to, to state who those people are because those are you know, yep. I never, people. I never want to out anyone, but I can say, however, that uh, the supervisor has been in touch with sex worker nonprofits. Um, St. James Infirmary specifically already is servicing that area. They've got volunteers coming out at a street based level. So, I mean, support is starting to happen across Cap Street, which is extremely important. And at the same time, the St. James Infirmary is a nonprofit. In order for it to provide services, it needs dollars. It needs donations. Yeah. It needs volunteers. Funding. So, like yes. any anyone who is listening to this right now, who's like, "How can I be an ally and advocate and be beneficial?" If you live in the area, volunteer. If you don't live in the mm-hmm. area, donate your donate. time. Donate a few Twitter retweets. Donate your expertise help uplift the organizations that are trying to minimize the harm that's happening in real time to sex workers. And at the same time, if you're a sex worker yourself and you are in a position where you're able to offer your knowledge and expertise, don't hesitate to reach out. Like Mm -hmm. the supervisor wants to hear from as many, 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 many voices as possible. And the fact that she's already spoken with five of us shows me that she's actually listening, which is a tremendous, tremendous, like, Tremendous positive. Like, we don't always get the privilege of having any elected officials take us seriously or give us the time of day. And we've actually got one. We got one. We got a live one. (laughs) But, like, really, though. So, like, huge shout out to her, too. Huge shout out to St. Jane's Infirmary, who's been doing the work, doing the work in real time and definitely could use more support getting that work done. Awesome. And and just stay tuned for those listening. If, if you do want to get involved as well and you want to loop in this conversation, um, I'm sure that Alice is going to provide us with some information on how to get in touch. Um, but there's just one more question as well before we go into that part. Um, the last question here is, are you also planning to go to other states to speak about decrim or legalization? Absolutely, yes. I think it's important that the conversation is forwarded particularly given that we only have one model for legal sex work in America, and that's Nevada. We have so much to learn from what Nevada did right, what Nevada did wrong. Like, great example, Nevada has had zero cases of HIV ever associated with the brothels. That's a huge safety win. We definitely did something right. Now, what is it that we did right so we can replicate that in as many places as possible? Because that's a huge, right. like, that's right. That's a really <laughs> good number. Like, mm-hmm. zero is the great number. We like that. So there's just so, so much. And I think it's important to continue to make myself available and really put my time into this and invest energy into this and continue to be a part of it. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Um, I really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation with you, Alice. Um, I would love for the listeners to maybe potentially get in touch with you as well. And maybe it's at that point where we ask, where can we find you? Yes, you can find me all over the web. The best place to find me is going to be thealicelittle.com. You will find links to my Patreon through there links to my OnlyFans through there, Instagram, Twitter. I have a variety of different handles on social media platforms because as we know, social media is not sex worker friendly and loves to take our accounts down. So you're going (laughs) to want to go to my website and just click on all the different ones. And of course, you can always email me to alicelittle at thealicelittle.com. My email is always, always open. I love getting to hear from folks. And I answer my emails personally about six out of seven days a week I get to them. I love it. I love it. And also, I will mention that you have a fantastic YouTube channel as well that is highly informative. And you have these like cool like coffee chats that are on there too, where you can just ask questions and stuff as well. There's a lot of information that's out there that you 
are just able to make it so accessible for so many people. So thank you for your work in doing that. And also just uh, for all of your advocacy work as well. I mean, a huge, huge fan. I mean, oh, amazing. <laughs> Um, for everybody else listening at home, it is Stripped by Sia on all major podcast platforms. Um, it's strippedbysia.com. If you want to pop on, the epi- uh, pop on the website there, you can pitch yourself if you want to be on the show. You can check out all the episodes that are up on there. Um, and it's a really great way to keep in touch. Um, it's also Stripped by Sia on Twitter, Stripped by Sia on Instagram. Um, if you are listening to the show and – want to tell more people about it, please share it. Share it with your folks. Share it with people that, you know, may need a better understanding of the work that it is that we do. Um, And feel free to subscribe, like, rate, review. Um, That would be greatly appreciated. That really helps with visibility and accessibility as well. So I would love if you did that. If not, that's totally cool. And another way you can support is, again, through my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash stripped by Sia. And it's new episodes every single Sunday, uh, dropping at midnight Pacific Standard Time. And that's pretty much it for today. Thank you so much, Alice, for joining me on this conversation. And, and thanks for clearing so many things up with us today. And thank you for the work that you do. Amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're listening to Stripped by Sia, hosted, produced, and edited by Steph Sia, music by Ted D, graphic design by Maria Bellandarama, and photography by Ian Davern.